All right. Well, uh, let me do an introduction again. This is uh, Physical Science, Physics 101 here at ANU, and uh, my name is Professor Steve Park. I'm from the U.S., and uh, my team of 11 students is visiting as exchange students on campus this semester, and so I'm privileged to be your instructor and look forward to a great semester here. All of the slides that you see are available in ENAS and all of the other homework information. And uh, we will use the recordings and post them uh, at the end of the day, every Thursday. We have another new member coming in, so I'm going to ask you if you would tell us your name and your study, uh, area of study. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Guadalupe. I'm doing the best Okay. All right, well, let's get started. Um, what is physical science? What is physics? If you look at this chart, it's... Um, can you see past me, Peter? If you look at this chart here, you can see that uh, in the diagram, we have all the sciences at the top. The two basic areas of science, social sciences on the left, natural sciences on the right. And of course, the natural sciences is uh, what we're, the school of science it contains here at ANU and at NNU. In natural sciences, there's two basic classifications. The physical sciences, which is what we're studying here, and the life sciences, or biological sciences. At our school, in our science building, we have two floors, and one floor is the physical sciences, and the second floor is the life sciences. So um, under physical sciences, we see five different areas, physics, chemistry, astronomy, um, meteorology, geology, and um, earth and space science. So we're going to focus directly in on the left-hand box there on physics for the rest of the semester. and. Um, we'll be talking about this most basic form of, of physical science, the study of physics. So we're also going to start by talking about measurements because everything we do in science is about measurements. And if you look over your shoulder back here at this cabinet, which we can look at together a little later, uh, we have a whole bunch of equipment for making measurements. All kinds of equipment, from an oscilloscope here with the blue screen, to a handheld meter like this one for making measurements of voltage and current and uh, power to measuring optics and light, measuring temperature, all kinds of things. Velocity, acceleration, temperature, pressure, time. So these are all quantities that we want to measure and know precisely and they're interrelated we're going to find out the laws with which they're interrelated. And we want to be able to measure them with certainty. But here's the question. Can we really measure everything with total certainty? When you measure something and you get six digits on this screen, six digits, maybe 1.23456, are you certain that that's the exactly correct answer? And if not, who knows what the right answer is? And uh, here we are at the beginning of class, and I would say, no. That's a discouraging news for the first day of class. No, you can't know everything with certainty. Then is one person who knows, and that is God. He knows the exact right answer. But we have to try to do uh, a lot of techniques to get as close as we can to the right answer. And you know, on that note, I forgot to say a prayer, and I want to start every class with a prayer, so we're going to take a moment here and say a prayer. You bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this first day of the semester. We thank you for what you can do, and we pray will do through us as we learn together, as we talk together, as we worship you together. We ask you for your presence and your power and your help as we do uh, this adventure of learning physics together. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, 
as we measure smaller and smaller things, well, come in, come in. It gets more and more difficult to uh, measure them with precision and accuracy and certainty. My career as an engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, has been in designing and building things that are microscopic. In fact, they're so tiny, we can't even see them with light microscopes. We have to use scanning electron microscopes to see these tiny things called microcircuits or microelectronics. And um, with those tiny things that we're engineering and building that make computer chips that drive the computers and the cell phones that we use, um, it is very difficult to measure those quantities without changing the answer. Our very measurement technique, when we stick these probes, if I stick these probes on a circuit board that you can go back there, if I stick them, that's a big object. And these tiny probes aren't going to do much to disturb that big object. But if I stick these probes on a micro circuit, first of all, they're 10,000 times larger than the thing I'm trying to touch. That's a problem. And then the electrical behavior, this meter, is going to completely alter what, hap what is happening on that micro circuit, completely change it. So how do I ever measure it? If I can't touch it, how do I ever measure it? And we have contactless means of measurements using light and using fields and sensors. We can measure things without contacting them so that we can uh, avoid disturbing them. Any questions so far? Welcome to class. I'll talk to, get your name later. Scientific investigation. You've all had this in high school. The scientific method. Uh, measurements are the basis of the scientific method, not just for science, but also for engineering. We, we observe phenomena, we uh, ask questions, how and why. Not just how and why, but how much. How much is going on? How fast? How much? Scientists assume a very important assumption. And I hope you'll join me in this assumption. I am both a scientist and an engineer, a physicist and an engineer. Scientists assume that the universe is orderly and can be understood because we know that God created it all and he said it was good. In the case of humans, he said it was very good. And God encourages us in our studies. He rejoices with us. He celebrates with us when we learn a new field of science like physics he wants us to know he wants us to understand his creation so god is cheering you along when you're struggling with a homework problem or working on a test an exam and he wants you to discover and i think every time there's a nobel prize winning discovery such as the higgs boson what they nicknamed the God particle a few years ago, only a few years ago. I think when that happened, God said, yes, they got it. They understand. So God cheers us on and he encourages us to study and understand. So here's the scientific method, which you've had before. We observe and take measurements. We say, hmm, what does this mean? I'm going to create a hypothesis a possible explanation. But now that I've created a hypothesis, I need to go back to the laboratory here and I need to test it by creating, designing a good experiment. And it's very difficult to design a good experiment. And then after testing that hypothesis, I, if, if I indeed see that the, please come in, that the data cor is correct, then I'm going to create a theory based on that test and if that theory is tested over and over and over again, over a period of years, like uh, Newton's laws, hundreds of years of testing, then we say, hey, that's Newton's law. That's a law. It's been well tested. It's, it's been well proven. All right, so uh, 
we need to use a lot of units in this class, a lot of units. And we have the standard system of units called the System International, SI. And we're going to use SI units throughout this course. We're not in the United States. These guys are not in the United States. And the United States is the only country, I believe, left in the world that uses what's called the English system, um, the British system. So you don't have to deal with it. At home, we have to deal with it. Pounds and miles and feet and inches and quarts and gallons. But here, we're free to just live in the SI system, and so that's what we're going to do. Expressed in magnitude and units, we uh, are going to study um, all the standard units and the derived units. So what are the standard units? And this, just, this slide just mentions what I just said. There are two systems of units, one in the United States and one in the rest of the world. By the way, a lot of us in the United States do use the SI system, even in daily life. So you hear a lot in the media about all these uh, strange English units, but in the U.S. there's a lot of Americans that use the SI system as well. So we're familiar, we're comfortable with kiloliters, even if I can't say it right this morning kilometers, and we're familiar with kilograms, kilos, and all of those good things. I'll probably uh, ask your names again at the end of class today so that I get to know you, but it's great to see every all the seats are full now. Let's see, we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, and uh, we were expecting to have 15, so we're only three away from our maximum class size. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Yeah, great. These slides are all on ENAS, and my name is uh, Professor Steve Park from the U.S. All right, let's talk about the first unit, the meter. Originally, this was defined as one ten millionth of the distance from here at the equator to one of the poles. One ten millionth. Of course, that's not a very accurate definition. You can see, by the way, that a meter is very close to the British unit of a yard, very similar in length to each other. A meter is now defined by the National Institute of Standards in the U.S. and the European System International. It's defined rigorously as the distance traveled by light in a vacuum in, I'm not going to try to read this number, but a fraction of a second. So the only way to define the meter now is to use uh, a laser and measure the number of wavelengths and that's the way a meter is defined, very precisely, very repeatedly. So when you take that meter measurement from one country to another you can get exactly the same length for the meter. What about mass? The unit of mass is the kilogram, and uh, it was originally defined as the amount of water in a 10 centimeter box. You take a little box of 10 centimeters, fill it with pure water, that would be de the definition of a kilogram. But now it's referenced to a standard block of, I think it's nickel some very inert metal that sits in a vacuum jar in Paris, France. There's a picture of it. That's the standard kilogram right there inside of a vacuum container and nobody wants to touch it because if they touch it they'll put their finger oil on it and add a little bit of weight to the kilogram. Dr. Park? Yes. Is the, is the kilogram the only one of the base units that are it's still by an actual physical I think it is, and by the way, that is also falling away. I just read an article a few months ago where the kilogram is being replaced by a non-physical definition, and I, it's very complicated. <laughs> and I'm not going to be able to tell you what that thing is, but it's not this anymore. Okay. What if somebody stole this? <laughs> How well would we know is the kilogram? 
So that, that would be bad. This one is in Washington, D.C. in the U.S., but there's one in Paris as well. Notice, by the way, that it's not exactly correct. Look at the number at the bottom of the screen. So somehow this copy, number 20, copy number 20, that went to the U.S. is not perfect. That's a problem. All right, so let's talk about mass. Mass is a fundamental quantity along with time and um, the meter distance. It remains constant all throughout the universe. The kilogram is a kilogram is a kilogram on Mars, on the Earth. But your weight, which is a measure of your mass times the gravity field in which you happen to live, that weight varies. We know that the gravity on the surface of the Earth is six times more than the gravity on the surface of the Moon. So if you went and weighed yourself on the moon, you would weigh, instead of, uh, somebody give me your weight in kilograms, just share it if you want to. Or I'll give you mine, which is a bad thing. <laughs> Anybody know their weight today, or roughly, approximately? 54. All right, so if, if you went to the moon with a weight of 54, you can do the math, divide by six. What is your weight on the moon? 54 divided by 6. He's going to give me the exact answer here with all the precision. 9. 9 kilos. Wow! You could just bounce, you know... <laughs> jump in the air and not fall down. So, uh, by the way, there's no air either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what about time? Time is a continuous forward-flowing chain of events. We know we can't go back in time, except in the movies. We can't go back in time. We can only go forward. It has one direction. And we also know from really advanced physics that time and space are intimately linked to each other, E equals MC squared, they're, they're linked. And the time and space can be modified, curved, bent, and that's really hard to imagine. That's what happens in a gravity field around the Earth. Time and space are bent by gravity. So, um, this second is a fundamental unit, the second. It was originally defined as one eighty-six thousandth of a solar day. That's not a very accurate measure, but now it's defined as the vibration of the cesium-133 atom, cesium gas, and that gas is used inside what's called the atomic clock. There's one in Colorado, there's one in Europe, um, those clocks are precisely tuned with cesium so that the number of vibrations defines one second. That's the system that's used to set GPS, Global Positioning System, all around the world. All the array of satellites are tuned to the atomic clock so that everybody's in sync, synchronized all around the world. So this is the definition. One second is equal to nine billion, nine billion oscillations of the cesium atom. Wow. All right. So it's SI system, System International. Here are the seven, the seven fundamental units. We talked about the meter. We talked about the kilo. We talked about the second. There are four more. The ampere, which is a unit of electrical current. The kelvin, which is a unit of temperature. The mole, which is the amount of substance, number of molecules. And the candela, which is the 
intensity of light, candela. So those are the seven fundamental units. And now we have everything on the basis of 10. That's why it's called the decimal system. Everything is in units of orders of magnitude. One order of magnitude is multiplied by 10. That's what an order of magnitude means. And we have these common prefixes that we use throughout science and engineering. You really need to memorize these. They're used on a daily basis. You use them when you talk about buying memory for your computer or a new hard disk or maybe a solid state drive. Does anybody have an SSD? You know, the little, there's portable ones and then there's one inside your PC, your laptop. So I carry a little SSD. This is not it. It's the same size. And uh, I keep, I back up all my information on an SSD, which I have a unit on my SSD that's not on this list. Maybe you do too. It's called a terabyte. Tera. Do you think it's bigger than giga? How much bigger than giga? Tera, how much bigger than giga? thousand times, right. So it's 10 to the 12. Terra is 10 to the 12. I didn't put it on this slide. Terra, and then giga, and then mega. These are all separated by 10 to the third power, 1,000 times. So a giga is 1,000 times bigger than a mega. A mega is 1,000 times bigger than a kilo. A kilo, and then a milli, is going the other direction, 10 to the minus 3, and a micro is 10 to the minus 6, and a nano is 10 to the minus 9. And I told you about my field of working in with computer chips and microelectronics, and every day we measure things that are a nanometer wide. Every day. So how can you do that? 10 to the minus 9 meters a nanometer. So what about the liter? The liter is a derived unit. It's not one of the fundamental units, but it's important. You remember the definition of a liter? Remember we talked about that little cube, that 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube of water? How much did that weigh? That little cube of water, how much did it weigh a moment ago? Yes. Thank you, Alex. So a kilogram of water is also a liter of water. It has a mass of a kilogram, 1,000 grams. And so now we can talk about a milliliter, which is a more common unit for your, let's see, how many milliliters? This is a lot of milliliters. This is probably, oh my goodness, it's English. It's American. It has ounces. Do you ever know what an ounce is? What is an ounce? You guys must know what an ounce is. Okay, so let's say this is, um, it's 32 ounces. I know 32 ounces is a little bit, right, but it's very close to a liter. Okay. But I don't know exactly what it is. Okay, your job right now, Josh, get out your calculator. Your job is to tell us how many liters are in my water bottle. It says 32 ounces. All right, so we'll wait and see what Josh comes up with. But a milliliter... 0 0.946353. So basically <laughs> one liter. Uh, really close to one liter. Yeah, like, like I said, 32 ounces is really yeah. close to a liter. I thought so. This is about one liter. So one thousandth of this, down here, one thousandth of this is a milliliter. And a milliliter is the same as a gram, one gram of water. And a milliliter is the same as one cc. Now, what is that one cc? What, how would I say that? What's the full word for a cc? Yes. Cubic centimeter. Cubic centimeter. Do any of you buy a car engine, automobile engine, based on how many cc's are in that engine? Does anybody know the number of cc's volume 
of your engine. The bigger the number of cc's, the bigger the power, the faster it'll go. So uh, a lot of times uh, we measure the size of an engine in cc's or anything with volume in cc's. Cubic centimeters, milliliters. However, if you switch from something from water to something else, how many of you have ever held mercury in a thermometer or in a beaker? Mercury, it's dangerous to get absorbed in your skin, but how, how many of you have ever picked up some mercury? It's a metal, right? It's a liquid metal at room temperature. Is it heavier or lighter than water? I, I'm finding it a little surprising that nobody has ever, has anybody ever, don't be shy, have you ever picked up uh, a container of mercury ever in your life? No one. Thermometers aren't on the mercury. Not anymore, of course. All right, so mercury is kind of a foreign substance to everyone, both from the U.S. and from Kenya. I used to play with it as a kid. <laughs> I'd roll it around. It's so much fun to play with, and I guess I didn't die, so it's okay. <laughs> um, mercury is so heavy. You can't, it's amazingly heavy. Please come in. So, uh, any other liquid is going to be a heavier weight in grams than water. Well, I sh yeah. There are some things that are lighter than water. What's something that you know that's lighter than water, that floats on water? Give me a liquid that is lighter than water. Oil. All right. Let's talk about the kilogram. The kilogram uh, is about two pounds, if you're looking at the American scale. Um, it's the amount of water in a 10, cube, a 10 centimeter cube, just, just like this picture shows. And if you go to the corner of that and take just one, one cubic centimeter, that would weigh one gram. And this 10 by 10 by 10, 10 by 10 by 10, is a thousand cubic centimeters, which is the same as one kilogram. Any questions about that? When you go back to this cabinet and you grab a standard weight of a kilogram, which we have some back there, to use for doing physics experiments, would it be made out of water? Probably not. It'd make a mess back there. I see one down at the bottom. It's usually made out of brass. Is brass heavier than water? Yeah. So if brass is heavier than water, and I need to get one exactly one kilogram, is it going to be larger than this block or smaller than this block? A kilogram of brass, is it larger or smaller? Smaller. smaller. It's a little tiny brass kilogram because it's denser, has a higher density. So what are the derived units? There's all kinds of derived units such as uh, volume, and area, and speed, which is distance per time, meters per second. There's density, we just talked about density, which is the mass per unit volume. How much mass does it have per unit volume? You can see that the materials inside the earth, we have a lot of materials, mostly rock, but if you look at the metals, aluminum, we know, is very light. You've held aluminum. It's very light metal. We make uh, aircraft out of aluminum, spacecraft out of aluminum because it's light. 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. Iron is much heavier, a factor of almost three, three times heavier than aluminum. And gold is very heavy. 19 grams per cubic centimeter. And the average for all the earth materials, if you put all the materials together, including all the rocks and so forth, is five, about 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. What is water? 
I'm just coming back to remind you, what is water? One. So we have earth is 5.5 and water is one. There's a lot of water on the earth. All the oceans. All those oceans are sitting at about one. So there must be something much heavier than water underneath those oceans. Much denser than water. So in liquids, when we measure the density of a liquid, we use what's called a hydrometer. Let's say that that liquid, I don't know what this clear substance is, but it's not water. It's some other chemical. Inside this hydrometer is pure water. So we're comparing the density of the pure water inside the hydrometer to whatever the substance is outside. And as that material outside gets denser and denser, what's going to happen to the hydrometer? As this stuff out here is denser and denser and denser, like, um, like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody give me a liquid that's dense. Okay. Like syrup. Or syrup. Do you know this? Syrup? Sugar water? So this is going to rise. It's going to float higher and higher because water is less dense than the thing outside. So we have all these units that we're going to talk about even today, the Newton, the Joule, the Watt, they're all uh, combinations of the basic seven units. Now, this is a really important topic. I hope I have your attention. And if you get bored, we'll just stop and get up and stretch. And I'm not used to teaching for three hours. This is something that's new to me, but we'll figure it out. And we'll take a break in the middle, by the way, for bathrooms and stuff like that. So I think, I think it's possible to go, I don't know, what do you do? You guys have been in this room before, I think. When you take a, 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 a washroom break, where do you go to the washroom? From here. I know that sounds like an embarrassing question, but where, <laughs> what washroom? This building has no washroom, does it? On the end, does it have a washroom? Oh. Right, okay, right down there, great. So we'll take a break. Um, we're going to talk about significant figures because everything we do in every homework problem in physics requires the knowledge of significant figures. Basically comes down to this. This measurement tool has the ability to, to measure accurately to a certain degree of precision. Maybe I can only measure accurately 5.12 volts. That is three numbers, 5.12. That's three significant figures. The screen may display 5.123467. It may display eight digits. What do I have to do if I know that the tool is not capable of measuring those accurately, repeatably? I have to throw all of those other numbers, even though they're on the screen and they're on my calculator because I did the math, but I know in advance that the accuracy of this measurement in this problem or in this tool is only three significant digits. I don't care how many digits the calculator displays or the meter displays. I must discard all those extra digits and throw them away. They're not meaningful. They're not reliable. So uh, it's wise to be really conservative with significant figures. A lot of times I encourage students to get used to using two. Just two. Which is usually, in scientific notation, it would usually be something like 1.3 times 10 to the third. Just 1.3. Two significant figures. Because a lot of times that's about the best that engineers and scientists can do with precision in the lab. So uh, this is a method of expressing the measurement properly. It's one of the things that really gets under the skin of physics and teachers when you put down an answer on an exam that says 
you know, three point five, six, seven, eight, nine, all all these, and then the teacher just goes, oh, oh, they don't know about significant figures. Uh, a mathematical operation such as multiplication, division, addition, subtraction cannot give you more significant figures than the weakest link. Whatever number in your problem is has the least significant digits. Whatever that number is. You may have five different variables in your problem. Five different numbers. But one of them only has two. The others may have six. Guess what the answer must have? Two. Whatever is the smallest number of sig figs, that's the only thing we can do with the answer. We can't keep any other digits. For example, 6.8 has two significant figures. I nicknamed them sig figs. Can you see that? Sig figs? Two sig figs. 1.67 has three sig figs. And here's a calculator that has a whole bunch of numbers displayed on it, a TI, Texas Instruments Calculator. But the two numbers we were dividing were 6.8 divided by 1.67. Which one of those has the smaller number of sig figs? 6.8 or 1.67, which one has the smaller number? Two, right? So when we look at this answer, we only get to keep two. Which two do we keep? The first two, but do we have to round? What is the right answer? I heard it somewhere back there, don't be shy. What's the right answer? If, uh, for this question, 6.8 divided by 1.67, what is the correct answer? This is not it. So we round that second digit there. How would we round it, up or down? Up. So what's the right answer? 4.1. 4.1 is the correct answer. So as a general rule, we report only as many sig figs as there are in the quantity with the least number of sig figs. And that's what we just went through. And here are the rules for sig figs. All non-zero digits are significant. So when you have things other than zeros, they're always significant. Those two numbers both have three sig figs right there. Zeros are significant if they are between two non-zero digits, like that zero right there and that zero right there, those two zeros are both significant. So that has four sig figs. This one is significant. It's stuck in here between the four and the seven. But look at this situation. Oh, the, the mouse isn't showing up. Interesting. Okay, I'll use the screen. So thank you, Peter. So here we have... Um, a three and a five, but all these are jammed in here just as placeholders. None of these zeros are significant. None of them are. So we just have two significant figures for that number, the three and the five. And then to the right of non-zero, like these two right here, to the right, these two zeros are probably not significant either. It's a little hard to tell. If you wanted to make them significant, if your measurement was really accurate, you would put, deliberately put a decimal point right here. And that decimal point would make that into four significant digits, significant figures. But probably it only has two. All right, rounding. You all know how to round, so I'm not going to teach you how to round. Let's talk about scientific notation. This is really important in, in science and math and engineering. So we're always going to try to write a number as a single digit with a decimal point and then all the other sig figs, however many sig figs we have. So we try to write it as a single number with a decimal point and then the rest of the sig figs times 10 to some power. So I know this looks more complicated than just writing 247. This looks easy, and this looks a little harder. 
But this is the scientific way. This is the scientific notation. So you see some other examples here. This one down here at the bottom. We count the number of spaces over here from, from the one decimal point. We would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One times ten to the minus seven. Or this big number here, we would count one, two, three, four, five, six. Four times ten to the plus six. So I want you to practice with this because we're going to use this for our answers on homework and exams. This is scientific notation. Engineers, by the way, do something a little different yet. They're strange. They are strange. They say, well, we don't really like these powers of 10 that aren't multiples of 3. We want to express everything in powers in 10 to the 3rd, or 10 to the 6th, or 10 to the 9th. We only like power, powers of 3 powers of 10. So they manipulate the answer. If you were going to take this times 10 to the 3rd, what would this number be? If you're going to change this to 10 to the 3rd, which is also known as a kilo, what would this go to? Five minus three is two. So I move this over by two. One eighty six one hundred and eighty-six times ten to the three. And then engineers would go one step further. They would drop the scientific notation. They would say one hundred and eighty-six kilos. So they use all the prefixes and they don't use scientific notation. They just use numbers with the prefixes. Here's an example, maybe. Here's the distance to the sun, from the earth to the sun. And for, and unfortunately, this is a miles, I apologize. I said we were gonna use kilometers, and here I have miles. 93 million miles, 93 times 10 to the six, or scientific notation would say 9.3 times 10 to the seventh. These are all the same. Forget this one, this is not a good one. It's, this is the right one right here. But if you're an engineer, you would do this, and you would replace the 10 to the 6 with what is the prefix for 10 to the 6? Remember what it was? Mega. Mega. So engineers would say 900. There's a typo there, my mistake. Please take that zero away. 93 mega miles. That would be the way an engineer would, re would prefer t to talk about it. 93 mega miles. Any questions on that? But we're going to stick with scientific, so forget the engineering thing. The right answer here is this one right here. 9.3 times 10 to the 7. And you know how to round, so I'm going to skip that. Let's look at one more topic, which is, how do you solve science problems? What's the method of approach that you use? You probably learned this in high school too. It's a little bit like the scientific method, but this is the problem solving method. And I really encourage you to use it literally on your paper when you're solving a problem to write it out this way. So the first thing you do is you read the problem and you identify the principle, the physics principle, and you write down, the first thing you write down in your paper are what are called the givens. What pieces of information are given to you in the problem statement? The givens. You write them down, the numbers and the units for each given. And you probably need to make a sketch of the problem to sketch it out be able to visualize it. Uh, and then you figure out, okay, what are the unknowns? Here are the knowns, the givens. What are the unknowns? What is this problem asking me for? What do I need to calculate? And write it down. Write down the unknowns. What is wanted? 
And then check the units and make conversions. I hope you don't have to do conversions too often. But then the next big step is finding the needed theory to solve the problem. Which equation from this theory is the right one to use in this case? So you've now got three things on your paper. The knowns, the unknowns, and the equation. Now it's just a matter of what we say in the US, plug and chug. It means you plug the numbers into the equation and you do the calculations and you produce the, the right answers, the uh, unknowns. And then you do something else for Dr. Park. You apply the appropriate units, never write down an answer without its units, and you use sig figs properly, and you write the answer in scientific notation at the very end. In scientific notation, proper number of sig figs, and the proper units. Any questions there? Yeah? You're good with it? Any questions? Let's just take a break. <sighs> any questions at all from either from any of the students in the class. Let me ask you a question. Have you all had this in high school? Yes? No? Mostly? I expected that this to be a review. Uh, now I get to have some fun. This is, uh, can you see this picture at the bottom? It's a little tiny satellite, a little box with a lot of electronics inside of it. And uh, at NNU we were blessed with the opportunity to build three of these over the course of about three or four years. And we were invited by NASA to launch these into space on a NASA rocket. And so there's three of different cube satellites that are orbiting the Earth right now. Probably one overhead here. I don't know. I have my phone. I can tell you where they're at, but I'll look later. Um, and they travel around the Earth, and they take data. And they have a, ra a tiny radio on board, and they radio the data back to the Earth. And we uh, receive that data, and store that data, and analyze it. In this case, this particular satellite is measuring the, <coughs> the effectiveness of several different polymers, plastics, in the space environment. How do they survive? How do they hold up? Do they degrade? Do they weather? in space. You say, well, there's no air there. How could they weather? Well, uh, the solar radiation is very intense, the ultraviolet light. There's all kinds of ionizing particles and uh, electric fields and magnetic fields and cosmic rays that uh, come and strike these plastics right here in this little window. There's an array of these plastics that are exposed, and we've been monitoring them now for five years. This little guy has been traveling around the Earth for five years. So, let's do some math. Let's practice our math. Are you ready? Get out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. We're going to do this problem together. All right, here goes. Here's the problem. The NNU Makersat goes around the Earth in a nearly circular orbit with a radius of 6,800 kilometers. Now, the Earth, what's the radius of the Earth? 6,400. Did you know that? The radius of the Earth is 6,400. So how high above the surface of the Earth is this thing flying? If the Earth is 6,400 and the total radius is 6,800, how high up is it? 400 kilometers. That's pretty high. 400 kilometers high. Okay, so here's the problem that we're going to solve together. At that radius, as it orbits, 
How many kilometers has it traveled over the last five years since it was launched into space? This is our challenge. How many kilometers has it traveled in five years? All right. What do we know? Write down the notes. We know the size of the Earth. You can draw a picture of the Earth. The Earth has a radius of 6,400 kilometers. We know that there's an additional 400 kilometers to get out to this little satellite. You could draw a picture of that. We know, what do we know? We know five years. What do we not know? There's a very obvious unknown here. We don't know the speed. What else do we not know? We don't know the mass. I didn't even tell you the mass. By the way, it's one kilo. But I'm not going to, it's not in the problem statement, so you don't get to use it. It's one kilo, and uh, we didn't, I didn't tell you the size. It's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters. That's the size. But I didn't tell you. You don't need it. Usually, usually, in a nice class led by a nice Christian professor, <laughs> you will be given just enough information to solve the problem and you will not be short, you will not be missing key information. Otherwise you couldn't solve it. You have to come back and say, I don't have enough information, I can't solve this problem. But I'm telling you, this is enough information. You don't need the mass, you don't need the size. So let's see if we can figure this out. The radius is given. Did you write down the unknown? The unknown is the number of kilometers traveled in five years. So five years is a given. Well, let's start out. Uh, you've got a picture on your page maybe now of the Earth and maybe a circle around the Earth, which is the orbit. Do you have that picture in your mind or on your paper? A circle, which is the orbit. And so we know a little bit about geometry. The circumference of that circle is 2 pi r. The distance all the way around one orbit is 2 pi r. Right? From geometry? So, we could calculate the circumference right now because you know r. I actually did it. You can pull out your calculator, but you see the number right here? I did the math. Circumference is 4.3 times 10 to the fourth kilometers. That's one orbit around the Earth. That's a long ways. Well, I'm going to give you another piece of theory that you might or might not know. You have to go to orbital mechanics to get this piece of theory, but this is not very hard. This is in physics one. The equation for the velocity of an orbiting object is the square root of g m over r. I could write this on the board a little bit nicer. Velocity is the square root of capital G, capital M over little r. This is r. The mass of the Earth. This is the mass of the Earth and the universal gravitational constant from Newton's laws. If you plug in G, which is 6.7 times 10 to the 11, this is the universal gravitational constant, or gravity. And you plug in the mass of the Earth, which is really heavy, into that equation, and you divide by 60, what was it, 6,800 kilometers? We can calculate the velocity of any satellite, no matter how large or how small, The velocity of any satellite that's orbiting at 400 kilometers high is, do you see it there at the bottom of the screen? About 8 kilometers per second. So when you watch one of these rocket launches, 